Um, but today I'm going to tell you about the kids that we study who have a disease called epilepsy, which I'll define for you in a few minutes. Um, and we study those kids to try and understand what are the genetic changes that cause epilepsy in, in these children. And there, there are a few reasons to find um, genetic mutations that cause disease, and I'm going to reiterate this throughout my talk. Um, one of those is so that we can uh, then do studies to understand the biology or the disease mechanism that's causing problems in the affected individuals. And we can do that in cells, we can do that in model organisms like mice, and now zebrafish is a popular model. And we can use those studies um, to try and develop or discover new and better therapies that we can then take back to the patients and improve their lives. And that's really the overarching um, goal of what I and many others um, in this building um, and around the world are doing um, in our research labs. Importantly, um, you know, I get to work in this space, which is uh, both clinical and research, so seeing the patients that I can then study. Um, and I get to work in this space where we do gene discovery to understand the genetic um, variants that cause disease. Um, and what's fun is that this process here can take a really long time to get back to the patient, but that's our long-term goal. But I'm lucky in that a lot of the work we do in this initial phase goes directly back to the patient, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, along the way. So um, let's talk about epilepsy. So epilepsy is a neurological disorder. It's actually quite common, um, and it's characterized or defined by recurrent unprovoked seizures. So if you've had two or more seizures uh, in your lifetime without any particular reason for having those seizures, you have a diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, we often use epilepsy and seizures interchangeably, so if I, I might do that, but really epilepsy is the disease and seizure is part of the disease. Um, as I said, it's a pretty common neurological disease, and in fact, uh, there was a report by the Institute of Medicine recently that estimated that one in 26 individuals born today will be affected by epilepsy at some point in their lifetime, uh, which means that several people in this room could be affected by uh, epilepsy at some point in your lifetime. In the United States, there are over 2 million affected individuals, and worldwide, there are about 50 million affected individuals. And importantly, epilepsy, although we talk about epilepsy, it's actually not a single disease. It's many, many different um, subtypes of epilepsy, and I'll define those um, a little bit later. Um, I should uh, define seizures. So seizures are, um, are events that happen um, that are due to ac excess electrical activity in the brain. So our brains always have a, a uh, low level of electrical activity. It's the cells talking to each other and sending signals to our muscles, um, to our eyes, to um, everywhere. Um, and, but when that gets disrupted, uh, it can cause a seizure. And many people think of um, seizures as one particular type of seizure, and that's the um, grand mal or um, generalized tonic-clonic seizure. So you've probably all seen this um, depicted in some way, either in the media or you may have um, affected family members or friends. And the grand mal seizure is a seizure that involves the entire body, arms and legs, usually shaking in a rhythmic fashion. Often um, the person ends up on the floor. Um, they're unconscious once the seizure happens and for some time after they're quite sleepy. And it can be a scary event. So this is uh, one type of seizure, but there are actually many, many different types um, of seizures. And I just want to give you a little bit of a flavor of what some of those can look like, because they're not all as um, impressive, I guess, as uh, grand mal seizures. So one type that we see a lot in pediatrics is called infantile spasm. And this is uh, a mom posted this uh, video. And this little baby right there is a little jerk, right? And you just watch. And it happens again. And these are called infantile spasms. And they're a particular type of uh, seizure that can occur in infancy, early childhood. Um, they may resolve over time, uh, or they may not. They may develop into additional seizure types um, in this, those children. Absent seizures, uh, you may have heard of. These are also, um, were previously called uh, petty mal seizures. And these are short staring spells. And they often affect um, kids in uh, elementary school age kids. And they're described as kind of a spacing off 
right? So the kid is uh, maybe sitting in class and the teacher might call the parent and say, like, your kid is just spacing off all the time. They're not spacing off, they're having a seizure. Um, and those are short um, and they eventually come out of it and go right back to what they were doing. Uh, there are myoclonic seizures, these are muscle jerks, so they might be an arm or a leg. Um, they're unanticipated because they're a seizure and it's an abnormal activity. Um, it can certainly uh, interfere with daily living. Tonic seizures we see in lots of severe pediatric epilepsies. These are just the, the tonic part of the tonic-clonic seizure, which means your muscles are stiff and you're just in a very stiff position and you can't do anything. Um, and then uh, another one that I can show you here is called a drop seizure or an atonic, which means no muscle tone. Um, and this is, um, well, I'll just show you what this is. <laughs> so this is a little boy, that's a seizure. Watch again. And if I had the video on, his mom saying, are you okay? He says, are you gonna have any more? And he says, no. And then drop. So these are drop seizures. And you notice he's wearing a helmet. And the reason is uh, that if he were walking down the sidewalk and had one of those seizures, he would drop to the ground. And so kids with atonic seizures or drop seizures are at risk for head injuries. Uh, kids and adults are adults with these, um, which requires them to take extra precautions. So we can measure um, and actually visualize seizures and electrical activity in the brain uh, with a test called the EEG. And this is an electroencephalogram. Encephalo means head. Uh, this is a picture of a baby with all these dots stuck onto his head. And each of those dots is a little electrode that's measuring electrical activity um, through the skull. So we don't, actually have to ha we don't have to put these right into the brain. That would be incredibly invasive. Um, and so each of these spots, their electrical activity is being measured and that's depicted here. So each of these lines represents one of those spots. Um, and I'm not a neurologist, so I can't give you a lot of details about what this means, but I think all of us in this room can probably do pattern recognition. So this is a normal EEG. It's kind of a baseline electrical activity. But when you hit here, you can see that all of a sudden, everywhere, the activity gets much, much greater. And this is the start of a seizure and this is the seizure happening. So this is how we, um, how neurologists uh, measure um, seizures and detect seizures on the EEG. And each of these lines, because it represents a specific spot, um, represents kind of a, a particular point in the brain. And so sometimes the activity is only in one part of the brain. So they can use this to start to figure out where is the seizure happening if it's not affecting the entire brain. So that brings me to types of epilepsy. Um, there are several types of epilepsy, and they're characterized generally by the types of seizures that you have, um, as well as other features like the age of onset, whether you have um, additional problems like autism or intellectual disability. Um, but the three major types um, are first, generalized epilepsy. And generalized epilepsy is characterized by seizures that affect the entire brain. Um, and so you can't pinpoint a specific spot where this seizure is happening. And there are several different subtypes um, of generalized epilepsy. Uh, and many of these are, uh, have their onset in childhood. They respond pretty well to epilepsy medications, so you can control the seizures pretty well. Um, and sometimes you outgrow the seizures over time. And you may have heard of some of these, so childhood absence epilepsy I described earlier, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, um, and febrile seizures plus. So I should mention that febrile seizures are also very common in the population, um, but if you never have another seizure type other than febrile seizures, it doesn't count as epilepsy, because usually that happens just in childhood and then it goes away. But febrile seizures plus means you then have additional seizure types later in life. Focal epilepsy is characterized by seizures where you can pinpoint a spot in the brain where the seizure starts um, and usually um, stays. And common forms of uh, focal epilepsy are, include temporal lobe epilepsy, which you may have heard of. It's one of the most common. But there are other kind of rare familial forms like epilepsy with auditory features. So they have um, hear things when the seizure happens. Um, frontal lobe epilepsy, this just describes epilepsy where the seizures happen in the front of the brain, for example. Um, and then finally, uh, what I'll spend the most time talking about a little later is something, it's a mouthful, developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. I'll call it DEE, or just severe pediatric epilepsy. Um, and this is the most severe form of epilepsy. It's pretty rare, um, but it can be devastating. So these kids have seizures that come on um, either 
um, anywhere from the first day of life to four or five years of age. The seizures are pretty hard to treat, and they often have um, severe developmental delays associated with that. And these are some different descriptions. So infantile spasms um, can occur this way. Dravet syndrome is one of the most common and well-characterized syndromes. Um, and these are some others that you may or may not recognize. Yeah, so this is the one we'll focus on later. As you can imagine, epilepsy is a pretty challenging disease to live with. Um, and there are several reasons for that. And these are outlined um, in the Institute of Medicine report that I uh, mentioned earlier. So you can have challenges at work and school. You can imagine that if your seizures aren't well controlled, you never know when they're gonna happen. They could certainly happen in the classroom, at the workplace, um, and disrupt uh, what you're doing. They can disrupt your learning. Driving limitations. So uh, you can imagine that driving and experience a seizure is not a good thing, neither is swimming. Um, and so individuals with epilepsy, um, if they have a seizure, they're not allowed to drive um, for at least six months. You have to be seizure free in order to um, get your license back. Um, there has historically been a stigma associated with epilepsy and in fact um, even in the time of Hippocrates it was referred to as the sacred disease and this is because um, when people saw seizures especially those grand mal seizures um, they assumed that that was a possession of the individual by a demon or a spirit um, and so thought that this was um, an affliction on the individual. And it's been tough to get past this stigma for, um, uh, for a lot of individuals. It's expensive. So um, it costs about $9.6 billion a year in the United States to um, care for everyone with epilepsy. That includes hospitalizations, um, for bad seizures or just for EEGs, medications, trying different medications. And some patients end up having surgery for their epilepsy. Uh, we have about 40 medications that um, neurologists can try to treat epilepsy. Um, they are variably affected, depends on the person, so they may or may not work well. Um, and these are drugs that obviously affect cells of the brain, and they can have serious side effects, behavior side effects, they can make you sleepy, they can make you not feel right. Um, so this um, in and of itself can affect daily living. And then there's an increased, um, there's increased mortality as well as morbidity in epilepsy, uh, including something called SUDEP, which is sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. Um, and that's, it's exactly as it sounds. And if you've been following the news the past couple of weeks, uh, this is a former Disney actor, Cameron Boyce, who about two weeks ago died in his sleep. He was 20. Um, and his parents revealed um, after his death that he had epilepsy. And so he likely died of SUDEP. So devastating, but one hope is that this raises the awareness um, for uh, physicians and families who are taking care of kids with epilepsy. So there are actually many different causes of epilepsy. Anything that injures the brain um, can cause you to have seizures. So that would be head trauma, infections like meningitis, um, tumors in the brain can cause um, seizures. And in fact, sometimes that can be the first um, sign of a tumor in the brain. Um, and then, of course, genetics, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and in the 1970s, um, this is a depiction of what people thought the causes of epilepsy were, and the um, uh, different uh, fraction of epilepsy, so it includes all these things I just listed. Uh, and most of epilepsy was termed idiopathic, and that was a medical term for, we don't know. Um, by 2014, uh, with additional uh, advances in, in various studies, some of which I'll tell you about, um, it became clear that a lot of that idiopathic or unknown cause of epilepsy is actually due to genetic factors. And I'll talk about some of those today. And in fact, um, even some of these causes, such as focal epilepsy with lesions, sometimes tumors or strokes, can be due to genetic factors as well. So what's the evidence that epilepsy is genetic at all? Well, a lot of this comes from early studies, um, particularly of families. So if you, um, and, and these were epidemiologic studies, so if you have a sister, a brother, a parent, a child um, with epilepsy, a first degree relative, you're more likely to have epilepsy yourself. Um, and in some families, we can see that epilepsy tracks from grandparent to child to grandchild. So really a direct kind of um, uh, genetic, uh, direct genetic uh, evidence here, although these families with really clear inheritance are actually quite rare. You're even more likely if your identical twin has epilepsy. Sorry. 
Um, and remember that identical twins um, have 100% of their DNA is the same. And so if one twin has epilepsy, the other twin has epilepsy. And that tells us it's likely to be genetic. This is a picture of uh, triplets, actually identical triplets, um, published a few years ago as an example. Uh, they all had seizures that came on at about the same age, same type of seizures, um, and their EEGs looked very similar to one another. So they have a form of genetic epilepsy. And then finally, you might ask, well, why do we care about epilepsy? Why, would you, why do we need to know what the genetic diagnosis is um, for epilepsy or any other disease for that matter? I'm biased because I'm a geneticist. I think it's really important. <laughs> um, but it's, it is important for a lot of reasons. Um, and the first, not even listed here, is that it provides an answer for the patient and for their family. Um, and you can't underestimate how, how important that is to, um, to families. Um, but it does all these other things too. So once we find a genetic cause, we can tell um, the patient and their family, this is what life generally looks like for, for other patients with the same genetic cause. We can talk about um, recurrence risk. So one of the first or second questions you get asked in pediatrics is, what's the likelihood if I have another child that this will happen again? And so when we know the genetic cause, we can give pretty good estimates about that for families. In some cases, it affects your choice of medications. So in some epilepsies, um, a particular medication will make the seizures better. And in another genetic cause of epilepsy, that same medication will make the seizures worse. And the last thing you wanna do is make seizures worse. It provides research opportunities for families uh, to connect with people like me and other people studying particular genetic epilepsies. And importantly, it also now connects families and I'll have a slide at the end to kind of show um, how this is working. So how do we understand the genetics of epilepsy? Well, to do that, we first have to understand a little bit about genetics. So I'm bring everybody up to the same page. Um, so when we talk about our genome, our genome is all of the DNA in our cells. And all of our cells, um, have exactly the same um, DNA. And you can think of uh, that DNA as the instruction units for building our body, for our body properly functioning. And it's similar to um, uh, like a full set of encyclopedias or a full set of instruction manuals. That DNA is packaged into what we call chromosomes. Um, and every cell in our body has a DNA packaged into 23 pairs of chromosomes. We get one of each pair from our mom and one of each pair from our dad. Um, and each, uh, we have 23 pairs, so they're numbered 1 through 22. In fact, just like these encyclopedias, 1 through 22. And the 23rd pair um, determines whether you're male or female. So you can think of each chromosome as uh, equivalent to a volume from the encyclopedia. And then if we go even finer, and we walk along that chromosome and read the A's, C's, G's, and T's of the DNA, uh, we come to sections of the chromosome that are discrete instruction units or genes. Um, and each of those genes encodes a protein uh, that has some function in the cell or in the body. And if we continue our analogy, you can think of that a little bit like reading through an encyclopedia or a, a book um, and coming to a particular sentence or paragraph that makes sense to you. Um, it's not quite equivalent because usually a book is written in a single language and you understand everything, but let's pretend this is a foreign language and all of a sudden you come to an English sentence, right? So each of these um, would be equivalent to a gene or instruction unit. Make sense? Um, humans have about 20,000 of these instruction units or genes. Um, and each of them um, has a code, so you've heard of the DNA code, uh, that tells the cell to make a particular protein or building block. Interestingly, the genes, as we walk along um, the chromosome, only accounts for about 1% of our DNA. The other 99% um, is probably um, support structure. Some of it we understand, some of it we don't. But we can't read it in the same way that we can read genes and know exactly what's going to happen. What we do know about genes is that if you have a spelling error or a typo in a gene, it can cause significant problems. Same is true if we go back to our analogy and say, what happens if we change one letter? If you tell your kid to wash the fishes, you're going to get probably a different result than you wanted when you asked them to wash the dishes, right? And that is a single letter change. Some single letter changes don't have quite the same um, significant impact, right? If you change wash the dishes to wash the eye dishes, you'll probably get the result you want. The same is true for DNA. So again, this is uh, A's, G's, C's, and T's. This is DNA. Um, and this is part, a very small part of a gene, 
that's important for red blood cells. And a single letter change in that gene, which is probably actually seven or several thousand bases long, um, is the mutation for sickle cell anemia. Okay, so single letter change and you have disease. Other single letter changes um, won't affect the protein so much and you won't have disease. So it's these types of single letter changes that we're interested in looking for to understand the um, genetic basis of pediatric epilepsies. Um, so what this is equivalent to uh, is sifting through full set of encyclopedias to look for that one change that changed dishes to fishes, right? So we have to have technology to be able to do that efficiently. And luckily we do. Um, so how do we find the spelling errors in the DNA? Uh, we sequence the genes. And by that, I mean we just read the DNA, and this is a, a small piece of DNA, um, and this is um, a sequencing technology that's been around for probably 40 years now. Um, and each of these little peaks, if you can't see, is a, is a different color and represents either a C, a G, a T, or an A. And so this allows us to pick out little pieces of DNA, read the sequence, and find where there are changes. Okay. It's very robust technology, uh, but this is fairly low throughput. So you can see that a scientist has to go and kind of read these letters and look for the changes. Luckily, about 10 years ago, a new technology finally came on the scene, actually in, in part developed by people who work in this building. Um, and we call this high throughput sequencing or next generation sequencing. Um, and it, what it does is it allows us to sequence millions and millions of pieces of DNA at the same time. And the computer reads for us the sequence of the DNA and spits out the sequence and tells you where the changes are, basically. Um, to give you a sense of the order of magnitude and of effect this has had on our field, um, this original technology was used to sequence the first human genome. This was back in the 90s. It took about 10 years to sequence that genome and it cost about $3 billion. It could sequence every one of your genomes in this room if you give me a spit sample not me, but theoretically, this could be done, um, every one of your genomes in a few days for about $1,000 each. So this has changed our field and allowed us to identify um, those spelling errors or genetic changes in lots and lots of individuals, both to understand normal variation and to identify disease changes. And so we wanted to apply this technology to um, those severe pediatric epilepsies or, or developmental epileptic encephalopathies. And as I already told you, these are the most severe of the epilepsies. Um, of the 40 drugs available, most of them don't work in these kids, even if you put them on three or four drugs at the same time. Um, and they have uh, very significant developmental delays. Um, some uh, will never walk or talk. Others um, will, but they'll be significantly behind their peers. Um, so there's a desperate need for novel, precise therapies. And as I told you in the beginning, our hope is that understanding the genetics will allow us to um, develop or discover new therapies. So this is kind of step one of that process. Um, importantly, DEE, because it's so severe, doesn't happen in families like this. Most of these kids, um, unfortunately, do not have their own families because they don't have um, the capacity to do that. They tend to occur in families that look like this. Sorry, I should tell you, um, each square is a male, each circle is a female. Um, so this is a husband and wife, these are their children. Um, and the blue squares or circles are people who have epilepsy, the white ones are people who do not have epilepsy. So in this family, nobody has epilepsy until, boom, one child. So there's no family history. And in the past, uh, we used to think, well, this must not be genetic, right? It's, not, it's nowhere in the family. It's out of the blue, so it's sporadic and must be due to something else. But in fact, what we know today is that it is genetic most of the time, but it's a new genetic mutation that happens in the DNA of that child, and neither parent um, has that genetic change. So it's not no genetic change in mom or dad, it only happens in this child and causes disease. So uh, when I started uh, my lab, which was about this era here, 2009-ish, we knew a little bit about the, the genetics of epilepsy and there were a handful of genes. So each of this, these series of letters is a specific gene um, that where if you had a mutation, um, you would have epilepsy. And the first one was actually discovered in 1995, which is when I started medical school, actually. Um, and they were discovered mainly in families like this, where we could trace it through the family. Um, but only a few of these were responsible for those severe pediatric epilepsies. So our goal, now that we have this new technology, was to look for additional causes of DEE 
so that we could improve our ability to diagnose kids, so that we could give better genetic counseling to families, and so that eventually, hopefully, we could develop um, better treatments. So who do we study? Uh, well, I'm lucky enough to have a large number of collaborators, both um, around the world and here in Seattle. And today in our lab, we have over a thousand individuals with, uh, we have DNA from over a thousand individuals who have one of these severe pediatric epilepsies. And often we have the DNA of their parents as well. These come from um, collaborators that we have in Australia who I've worked with for about the past 10 years. You know, pediatric neurologists who've collected DNA from individuals with epilepsy for years. Um, they come from collaborators at Seattle Children's and the University of Washington, including uh, my own clinic over at Children's. Um, and over the years, we've developed a number of collaborators from around the world who will also occasionally send us um, patients. And so we wanted to find those genetic changes in these um, individuals. And so we've used two very similar approaches to do that. Um, the first approach I'll call a candidate gene approach. So this is an educated guess as to what genetic mutations might be causing epilepsy in these kids. Um, so we pick uh, 50 to 100 genes. We say, you know, this gene is important for the function of the brain. Uh, we know that for various reasons. We predict that if there's a mutation in this gene, it might cause epilepsy. And so we sequence all 50 to 100 of those genes at one time in 1,200 patients. Um, and then we look for those genetic changes um, in the kids that we don't see in normal individuals. And importantly, we want to we want to see uh, multiple um, individuals who have changes in the same gene because that would make the most sense. Um, and so, how do we know if a genetic change is causing disease? This is a really important step um, in the process, uh, and there's actually a lot more that goes into it. This, but the basic premise is that. A genetic change that causes a really severe, devastating epilepsy should not be seen in healthy people because we would expect them to have disease. We can read the code of genes, remember? So we want the change that we see to be predicted to mess up the function of the protein. As I just said, we really want to see multiple individuals who have a change in the same gene because then we start to get more and more evidence that that's a, an epilepsy gene. And for these severe disorders, uh, we expect that that genetic change is going to be new or de novo in the child. And so often when we um, first identify a genetic change in an individual, the first thing we do is go back to their parents and sequence their, that, that place and that spot in their parents and ask, does either parent have the disease? Because their parents are healthy and we wouldn't expect that if the parent had the same change, um, it would be disease causing. More likely it would be just um, a variant in the population that's not causing um, uh, any, any issues. Um, so we use this approach and we see, we've sequenced about probably 500 genes, um, kind of 50 to 100 at a time in our entire population. And we had some really nice um, early discoveries. Um, and I've just listed some of them here and the general function of the protein for those of you um, uh, who are curious is listed on the right. Uh, the first gene is a gene called CHD2. It accounted for about 1% of our cases, and that may not sound like a lot, but actually is a significant advance given that we knew very, very little about genes that cause DEE. And importantly, actually now we know that if you sequence kids who have autism or intellectual disability, sometimes this um, same gene uh, causes that disorder as well. And that's actually true for a lot of epilepsy genes or autism genes or intellectual disability genes. There's a lot of overlap between those um, um, conditions. We found another gene called GRIN2A. Um, this, uh, importantly, this gene was present in about 10 to 20 percent of patients with a particular subtype of epilepsy. Uh, and for years, people thought that this was an autoimmune epilepsy and would treat it with steroids. And now we know that a significant portion of those patients are actually have a genetic cause. It's not autoimmune. It's completely different. And we actually have drugs that are targeted to this um, glutamate receptor, which is encoded by the gene. So it gives us hope that there might be specific therapies for some of these kids. And we never would have probably tried these drugs um, without knowing the genetics. Um, and this is just another example, causes another type of epilepsy. Um, and again, as we get finer and finer subtypes, sometimes a specific gene causes a specific subtype. And in total, we've identified over a dozen new genes for epilepsy using this candidate gene or educated guess approach. And as I already said, many of them also cause um, related conditions. 
So the second approach we use is actually to sequence all of the genes at once, all 20,000. Um, and when we do this, it's important to remember that the more DNA you sequence, the more changes you're going to find. And then you're going to have to decide which of those changes is causing disease, if any. So when we sequence all 20,000 genes, which is about 30 million letters of DNA, we actually sequence mom, dad, and the affected child at the same time. And the reason that we do this is because it, is it, because it very efficiently allows us um, to identify the new changes in the child that aren't present in either mother or father, right? We can do a direct comparison of mom's DNA, dad's DNA, and the kid's DNA. So this is time for audience participation. How many, if I sequence all of your genes and all of the genes in both of your parents, how many new changes am I going to find that affect the protein? Take a guess. 30 million bases of DNA. It can be a wild guess, it's okay. I got a 200. Well, I'm only sequencing 30 million bases of DNA, so not 50 million. Yeah. 10%, okay, that's a good guess. We got 200, we got 10%, which is 3 million. 30, getting closer. You actually only find about one, okay? Yeah, <laughs> so this is really efficient, <laughs> right? Um, it allows us to pick up, and, and usually it's actually about zero to five new changes in genes when you compare a child to their parents. So probably every one of us in this room, if we were to sequence your DNA and your parents, you would have um, differences in your DNA compared to your parents. It doesn't mean you're going to have disease all of the time. So that's important to remember, right? We can't just say, oh, we found a new change, this is causing disease. We have to think a little harder about it and do some additional work. But this is a really efficient way to kind of pull out what we think might be disease-causing genes that we can further study, either in additional patients or in a dish, for example. So we've done this now for about 200 trios, or mom-dad-child pairs. Um, we've solved or identified the genetic mutation in about 25% of those um, families. Um, and we've identified at least seven new epilepsy genes using this um, uh, method. Some of the um, solved cases are due to genes we already knew cause epilepsy, but some of them are new, um, new causes. And there probably will be more than seven. We're just continuing to do additional work on some of the other candidate genes that we've identified. So if we put all of this data together um, from, and this is, this is work just from the patients that we've studied, um, what I'm showing you here uh, is, are the genetic causes for the patients in our 1,200 that we've solved, and we've clearly solved um, a little over 200 patients out of the 1,200. And so each purple bar here represents a gene, and the height of that bar is the number of patients who have a mutation in that gene that causes their epilepsy. So the first thing to notice is that there are a lot of different genes where if you have a damaging mutation, you will have epilepsy. Um, the second to notice is that some of them more frequently we find mutations than others. Some of them are very, very rare causes of epilepsy. And in fact, for all of these here at the tail end, only one of those 1,200 patients um, is due to a mutation in each of those genes, okay? Um, yeah, so this tells us that, that epilepsy is actually quite diverse as far as um, uh, the types of mutations that can cause it. And what I'm showing you here is just um, uh, the orange bars represent genes where our lab played a significant role in actually discovering that gene as a new epilepsy gene. And then for some of the other genes, we weren't the first to report it, but we have a significant number of patients that we've gone back to and characterized what exactly does their epilepsy look like so that we can tell other families if their child has a mutation, what their epilepsy will look like. Um, so if you remember uh, when I showed you when we started our work about 10 years ago, there were probably a dozen genes here that were known to cause epilepsy. Most of them didn't cause the severe pediatric epilepsy. Um, and it's right about this time that that new sequencing technology came online. So between our work and the work of many other groups doing similar gene discovery projects, this is the rate of gene discovery in the severe pediatric epilepsies. And it's still going up. This is actually, this ends at 2015, so I need to update it. <laughs> um, and again, the, the red stars um, represent genes or, or chromosome regions where our group has played a significant role. 
Um, but you can see there are many other genes that have been identified. And in total, there are over 70 different genes where if you have a severe genetic change, you will have a severe pediatric epilepsy. <coughs> And this is all due to the fact that we have better sequencing technology and that we can look for those new changes um, in children compared to their parents. So how do we use this information? Well, in the clinic, it's actually quite significant. So um, whereas 10 years ago, we might have tested one gene in a child who came in with a severe epilepsy, and if they had a mutation, great, we said we know the cause, but probably well over 90% of the time, they didn't have a mutation in that gene, and we said we don't know. Today, we can sequence hundreds of genes at once, and the same technology that I just told you about that we use in the research lab, you can now um, send a clinical test. So if I see a patient in clinic, I can say, please check all of these epilepsy genes for um, changes uh, to let me know if this child's epilepsy is due to a genetic cause. And um, today, we can um, provide a genetic diagnosis for almost 50% of kids who come to clinic who have one of these severe epilepsies. And it was probably a few percent 10 years ago. So this is um, a huge advance. And as I already told you, um, it, this has a huge impact on families and provides all of these um, improved opportunities for families as well. So what do we do about the other 50% where we haven't found the genetic cause? Well, we still think it's genetic in most of those cases. We think we just haven't been able to identify it. And everything that I've told you about so far is looking at that 1% of DNA that um, is the, the genes or instruction units that we're able to read and, um, and interpret, right? These red sentences. But our next step actually is to move on in our patients where we have not been able to find a mutation or a genetic cause and to sequence the entire genome or 100% of the DNA. So to, to read the entire set of encyclopedias. So I told you we only find one new change if we sequence all the genes. How many new changes do you think we find if we sequence the entire genome? I gotta vote for one. Should be a simple math problem. It's closer to 100. It's actually about 60 to 80 new changes in a child compared to their parents if you sequence 100% of the DNA. Um, that's a lot of new changes in each child to consider, especially when we can't really read the language very well. So this is gonna take a lot longer for us to understand which of these changes, probably only one um, in each uh, individual, which of these changes might be causing epilepsy in those kids. So um, this is an ongoing project in the lab, and um, if you invite me back in a few years, um, maybe I'll be able to give you an update on what we found. The other thing we're doing is looking at not sequence changes, but what's called epigenetic changes or modifications to the DNA. So adding something to the DNA, changing its conformation. Um, so this would be equivalent to um, not changing the spelling, but maybe using all capitals or bold or italics. Um, so it, it changes the emphasis. So it might change the amount of the gene that's expressed by the cell, for example. Um, and uh, this is another ongoing project in the lab. Specifically, we're looking for a modification called methylation, which can turn genes on and off. Um, and so that's another one that will take us a little bit of time to figure out. So what does all this um, genetics tell us about epilepsy and how does it help us? Um, this picture here is um, two brain cells talking to each other. So they're talking through these molecules here. Um, and remember, I told you there's a lot of electrical activity, and when that goes awry, that's how you get a seizure. And um, we, early days, when the first genes were discovered, most of them occurred in these, um, these kind of channels that let the molecules go in and out to talk to each other, called, called channels, um, or neurotransmission. And that was great, but it kind of, it, it, it was a narrow view of what types of processes, if you disrupt them, might cause epilepsy. And what we knew, know now by doing the genetics and finding the genes that cause epilepsy is that there are many different processes in the cell that if you muck them up, uh, they'll cause a disruption of normal brain activity and can cause seizures, intellectual disability, and autism. And some of those are just depicted here. And some of them were quite surprising. So there's a whole class of genes um, that we've identified. There are actually many more than this now that actually are responsible for turning other genes on and off. Now we have to figure out, okay, which gene, if, I'm, if I change this one, what genes is it turning on and off um, that now it's not turning on and off properly that, it, that it's causing the epilepsy. 
But importantly, each of these now um, provides us information and gives us new um, uh, inroads, I guess, or um, uh, mechanisms to study to try and develop new therapies for, for kids who have disruptions in this pathway, for example. Can we find a new drug that might work on their epilepsy compared to the drugs that would work on this epilepsy? But how do we do that? So going from a genetic diagnosis to a precision therapy or precision medicine, term you may have heard um, recently quite a bit. Um, we can do that in several different ways, um, some of which I kind of alluded to in the first slide. And I'll just say right now that this is not um, specific work that's active in my lab right now, things we're thinking about, but I'm going to tell you about some exciting things in the field that other people are working on um, that might make this happen. So we can study um, cells in a dish. Uh, we can study model organisms, like I said. Mice um, are the classic genetic model organism, but there are many others. There are worms, there are fish, there are fruit flies, um, and others. And all of these, um, of course, have genes, and many of their genes are very similar to human genes, and that's why we use them as models. Um, and then now we can use patient cells, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this, um, and actually do stem cell studies um, using cells from patients who actually have epilepsy and study their epilepsy specifically. So let me tell you about epilepsy in a fish. And this is exciting work from a group um, at um, University of California, San Francisco, who's who is using um, zebrafish as a model organism for epilepsy. So zebrafish are tiny. Um, they're not actually that big. <laughs> this is a 96 well plate that we often use in science. It's about this big, has 96 holes in it. Um, and so you can put one fish in each of these wells in its little um, you know, media and watch it move. And you can actually put cameras under there and watch it automatically. Um, fish usually don't move that much. They kind of hang out on the sides of the, of the wells. Um, and you can track that, so this is a normal fish. If you take a fish and you create a mutation that causes epilepsy in that fish, um, some of those fish actually seize. And so this is motion tracking of one of those wells from a fish that's having a seizure. Big difference, right? And so this is something you can automate and actually track in those 96 wells and say, well, these fish are having um, frequent seizures and they're not normal. That's interesting. What's more interesting is that um, now that you have this tracking device, you can actually um, put a drug in the water and fish absorb the drugs through their skin. Um, so you could put a different drug in each of those wells and look then to see which of those fish who were moving like this now move like this. And so this is a way that we can start to do what we call high throughput screening or um, you know, testing many, many different drugs simultaneously to figure out ones that might actually work um, in people. Um, as you can imagine, it's really hard to go from treating a fish to treating a person. Um, but there are actually a couple, at least a couple of drugs now in clinical trials that were identified um, in, a, in, a, in a genetic epilepsy fish um, that, that treated the fish's epilepsy. And they're now in, in clinical trials um, in people. The next thing um, we can do is uh, study human cells. So we can take skin cells from a patient or a normal individual. Um, grow those skin cells, um, treat them so that they actually revert back to what we call stem cells, and stem cells can generally become any different type of cell. We treat those stem cells then with growth factors that cause them to become brain-like cells um, or neurons, um, and we can even let those just cells just grow and ball up themselves, and they become little what we call organoids um, that are actually they're not really mini brains, but that's, that's the term we use. Um, so they're collections of cells that are brain-like cells. Um, and if you take it from a patient who has a genetic epilepsy, all those cells will have the same mutation. Um, and then you can measure electrical activity um, in those cells, for example, and see um, abnormal electrical activity. And you can do similar experiments like you did in the fish and treat them with potential um, drugs that might change this abnormal electrical activity back to normal. Um, so this is technology that we're working with some collaborators at Children's um, to develop. We've actually grown these little um, brain organoids in the lab um, and are working to learn how to measure electrical activity and look at the genes that are expressed in those cells um, and studies like that. So I hope I've convinced you that the gene discovery process 
for epilepsy um, has been a successful one and I think is important um, for moving on to do additional studies that will hopefully lead us to the identification of better treatments for our patients with genetic epilepsy. And just to drive the point home, <laughs> um, remember that these the genetic diagnosis and the discoveries that we've made so far have actually had a significant impact on patients in clinic who come in with um, a genetic epilepsy. Um, and importantly, um, these discoveries that are made in the lab move rapidly to the um, clinic um, so that we can provide tests for families, give better um, counseling to families. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I think probably one of the biggest changes I've seen in the past 10 years of um, doing rare disease research um, is that we used to wait years for rare, rare diseases. We'd find a patient with a mutation in a gene causing a rare disease. We would have to wait years to find that second patient out there in the world somewhere who also has a mutation in that gene. Social media, the internet, has changed all of that. And so now for many of the different genetic causes of epilepsy that we've identified, where we might have one patient in Seattle, if any, um, the minute they get the diagnosis, uh, they go to Google or Facebook, um, search that gene name. And for many of them, um, there are family support groups and foundations that already exist. So SCN2A is a gene. They're actually having a family um, uh, meeting in Seattle next week where individuals from all over the country who have mutations in this gene and epilepsy will come gather in Seattle, meet each other, um, hear from uh, physicians and scientists working on SCN2A epilepsy, and I think what's really important is that families are powerful, right? So they can raise money um, for research, for example. They can, um, and they're, they're, most of them are doing that, and they'll provide grants um, for individuals to do research or to support postdocs or graduate students. Um, they can also collect information. So they have at their fingertips, not one patient with that genetic epilepsy, many, many patients with that genetic epilepsy. So it provides a really rich research opportunity um, to understand what medications work, what's your child's development like, what therapies work, um, and many other uh, types of questions that you can ask these families. And so this is just a sampling. I actually um, pulled most of this off of a, a Twitter um, image that uh, another researcher had posted. Um, but each of these is a different specific type of epilepsy, and these families are finding each other and driving um, research. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to leave you some, for some resources if I've piqued your interest um, about epilepsy specifically. Um, the Epilepsy Foundation is a great resource for families with epilepsy or just for learning more. Um, and then these are three books that all are kind of epilepsy themed. This one is, um, I think it's based on a true story. It's about a young girl with one of these severe pediatric epilepsies, but um, gives a flavor for some of the stigma and the uh, differences in understanding what epilepsy is and how to treat it um, in different cultures. Um, this is a recent one that I just read. He's a New York Times reporter, um, but he suffers from epilepsy. Um, and it's a really good read if you just wanna learn about what it's like to live with epilepsy um, and how to care for someone or um, you know, a friend who has um, epilepsy and what to do if they have a seizure. So these are, are really good reads. And then finally, I just want to thank um, my group. So this is uh, my research group who's um, done most of the work that I've told you about. Um, specifically, Allison is a postdoc who's done a lot of the um, sequencing all the genes and interpreting the changes. She's doing the work on sequencing, sequencing the whole genomes. Um, Malavika, who's here, oh yeah, Malavika, who's here, I think, um, is doing a lot of that work that I described that we're moving towards looking for those modifications of DNA that might cause epilepsy. Um, and then we have many others, uh, about half of these are undergraduates from the University of Washington who come through the lab and um, get to try their hands at research and understanding genetic epilepsy as well. And I will stop there and take questions.